And this evening's MC, Genevieve Wood. Good evening. It is so great to be in New York. All these conservatives in one room in New York. This is awesome. Wow. And it's a sellout crowd, by the way. I know some of you are standing. Hopefully it's mostly Heritage staff back there. Uh, we are delighted to see so many longtime supporters and friends in the room. But 60% of the folks who register for this event are first timers at a Heritage event. How many of you here the first time at a Heritage event? Hands. Wow. This is awesome. Well, we are delighted you're here. We have a great program for you. I hope you've had a great time so far. Uh, but I hope, I know that you're not here just to have a good time. You're here because you know standing up against socialism is important. And you want to be about doing that. So thank you for caring about your country and being here. And of course, one of the ways to do that is fight against bad policy, some of which we heard mentioned by a few friends in the video there. But it's also about going on the offense and changing hearts and minds on this issue. Uh, far too many of our fellow citizens are beginning to think, well, you know, maybe socialist policies would be good for me. Maybe they'd be good for the country. Uh, we have way too many young people who think socialism, even though it's never worked anywhere else, it's been tried, somehow they think maybe it would work here. But we know it won't. So what are we gonna do about it? And how are we gonna make sure that socialism is never going to take root in American soil. Well, that is what we want to talk about tonight. And one of the ways to do that is to understand who's behind this, what's behind this, why are people all of a sudden seeming to maybe warming up to the idea of socialism? Is this just a fad on college campuses? Is this just the kind of new philosophy of former bartenders from the Bronx who somehow end up members of Congress? What Americans really know about this? Well, I dare say that our special guest this evening is an expert on these questions. The New York Times, of all journalistic outlets, has said that he is the most influential public intellectual in the Western world. High praise. His book, 12 Rules for Life has sold over 3 million copies. I know many of you in the room have it, and I saw some of you flipping through it as you were standing around the reception. And if you follow YouTube, if you go to his page, or you just want to download one of the videos where you can see him, his videos have been downloaded half a billion times. I know there, every politician would love to have that many followers, wouldn't they? Oh, well, thankfully, he's not a politician. He is a clinical psychologist. He is the professor of psychology at the University of Toronto, and he is our special guest tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Dr. Jordan Peterson. <laughs> Half a billion times. People are interested in what you have to say. It seems that way. <laughs> Somewhat of a shock. Well, maybe it's because you aren't a politician. You are a psychologist, and you're understanding more about what's going on in the world than many of our lawmakers uh, actually do. And I know we've got so many ways that we could go with this interview yep. tonight. Uh, and we got questions. Thank you to all of you in the audience who sent in your questions. I've got some of them right here, and we're going to get into those. But let me start with, let's just start with the socialism piece. Do you think Americans truly understand the history of socialism and actually what it is? As you've gone around, I know you've had, when you speak to, to uh, not just college campuses, but you've been to events around the world, I think 250,000 well, people you've spoken in front of. I mean, people are unbelievably ignorant about history. And, and I mean, I, I would include myself in that, you know, I mean, I know what I know about the history, say, preceding the 20th century is very sketchy. It's embarrassingly sketchy, you know. Um, and what young people know about 20th century history is non-existent, especially about the history of the radical left. I mean, how would they know? They're never taught anything about it. 
So why would they be concerned about it? And, and you know, it, it, for, for many of the people in the audience, you know, you're old enough so that the fall of the Berlin Wall was, well, that was part of your life, you know. That was really the end of the Second World War, let's say, in, in, in a technical sense. And it was very meaningful. But that's a long time ago. There's been a lot of people born since then. And it's ancient history. And we don't have that many good, bad examples left, you know. There's North Korea. Um, there's Venezuela, but we're not locked tooth and nail in a war with, you know, in a proxy war or in a cold war with the Soviet Union. And, and it's easy to understand why people are emotionally drawn to the ideals of socialism, let's say, or of the left, because it draws on, it draws its fundamental motivational source from a kind of primary compassion. And that is always there in human beings. And so that proclivity for, se for sensitivity to that political message will never go away. And so, and, and it's important to understand that. You have to give the devil his due, unfortunately. You, <laughs> <laughs> you, you've also said that people aren't as resentful at the success of others as we might think. And I think as, as you watch a lot of people being interviewed today and you watch some of the students being interviewed, you saw some of the ones up here, you hear people talking a lot about inequality, but you say they really aren't as resentful as we might think as long as they don't think the game is fixed. Yes, well, that's certainly the case. Well, first of all, I mean, if you look at the psychological literature to the degree that it's accurate, which is difficult to ascertain often, um, people report far more prejudice against their group than against themselves. So, so that's quite an interesting phenomenon as far as I'm concerned. So um, w there's a tendency for people to exaggerate the degree to which the group they belong to has, is currently suffering from, from generalized oppression. They've been relatively free of it themselves. Um, I also think that yeah, fairness is an, an absolutely essential, and perceived fairness is an absolutely essential component of peace. Because people can tolerate inequality, so to speak, or even revel in it, let's say, if they believe that the unequal outcome is deserved. I mean, look at how people respond to sports heroes. You know, everyone... No one goes to a sports event and boos the star, even though he or she is paid much better and attracts the lion's share of the attention, hopefully not in too narcissistic a manner. People can celebrate success, but they do have to believe that the game is fair, and, 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 and the game needs to be fair, because otherwise the hierarchy becomes tyrannical. The problem with the radical left is that it assumes that all hierarchies are tyrannical and it makes no distinction between them and that's an absolute catastrophe because, you know, there's plenty of sins, let's say, on the conscience of the, of the West as a, as a civilization, but you can't throw the baby out with the bathwater and there are far worse places like all the other places, for example, <laughs> that there have ever been. Well, it's the case, and people also don't understand that, and they also don't understand this is something that's of particular importance. They also don't understand, and that, that may even characterize you in this audience. It's very, the, the knowledge of how rapidly we're making economic improvements around the world, in the developing world, for example, how fast that's happening, that is not well distributed knowledge. You know, that between the year 2000 and the year 2012, the rate of absolute poverty in the world fell by 50%. Now, it's a UN figure, $1.90 a day, that was their cutoff for absolute poverty. And so the cynics have said, well, you know, that's a you know, pretty low barrier. It's not such an achievement to have attained that, but I can tell you it's an achievement to have attained that if you were living on less than a dollar or ninety a day to begin with. <laughs> but if you look at if you double the amount to three eighty or you double it again to seven sixty, you find the same pattern 
I mean, the poor in the world are getting rich at a rate that is absolutely unparalleled in all of human history. And I think, I think a large part of that, large part of that is happening in Africa, where, by the way, here's another lovely piece of news. Um, the child mortality rate in Africa is now the same as it was in Europe in 1952, which is, I mean, that's an absolute miracle. Right? It's, 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 it's insane that that's not front page news, right? It, it, it's, that, that's, that's within a lifetime. And the fastest growing economies in the world are also there. And so, um, and, but, but, but as you're saying, but, the, the, but why isn't it front page news? And when you're considering social media and how fast news and photos and all that can travel, and that young people are aficionados of all this technology, yeah. why don't they know these things? Or why aren't they computing what they see as being progress? Well, I, I think part of it is that things are changing so fast that none of us can keep up. Like, it's hard to keep the story updated. I had no idea, for example, that most of the world's economic news, and even a substantial proportion of its ecological news, by the way, was positive until I started to work on a UN committee about five years ago on sustainable economic development, and I read very widely economically and, and also ecologically, and realized that things were way better than I had any, uh, any sense of, that, 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 that these improvements had come at a tremendous rate. And, and, but you see, part, so, so partly it is just that it's so new that we don't know and we don't have a story about it. And, 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 and who, is, who, who's, who would be driving the communication of such things, especially given two other things. One is that human beings are tilted towards negative emotion in terms of its potency. And so, for example, people would rather, they much, they're much less happy to lose $5 than they are happy to gain $5. We're loss averse. Or we're more sensitive to negative emotion than we are to positive emotion. And there's a reason for that. And the reason is, well, you can only be so happy, but you can be dead. And, and right, and I mean, dead is that's not good, and and there can be a lot of misery on the way to that end, and so we're 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 tilted to protect ourselves, and that makes us more interested in some sense and more easily captivated by the negative than by the positive, and so that's that's a hard bias to fight. And then, when you also take into account, and I think this is something that's ser worth seriously considering, because the other thing we don't understand is the technological revolution that's occurring in every form of media. Uh, no one understands it. And, but one of the consequences is, is that the mainstream media, so to speak, is increasingly desperate for attention. Right? They exist in a shrinking market with shrinking margins. All of the leading newspapers and magazines are feeling the pinch. Television is dead you, because YouTube has everything that television has and then uh, incredible array of additional features. And radio is being replaced by podcasts, and so it's a very unstable time for the mainstream media, and what would you expect them to do except to do whatever they can to attract attention in whatever manner they can manage? One example of this, one very good example of this, is you, you may or may not know that the rates of violent crime in the United States, and, and actually in most places, have, have plummeted in the last 50 years. It's, it's really quite remarkable. The United States is now safer in, in terms of violent crime than it has been since the early 60s, and that was probably the safest time there ever was. Um, but the degree to which violent crime has been reported has increased. Um, it, it, it's funny, the curves are almost completely opposite to one another. This is the decline in violent crime. This is the increase in the reporting of violent crime. And the reason for that is, well, people read stories about violent crime, and then, of course, they're much more likely to believe that it's on the increase. And the people who are most likely to believe that it's on the increase, by the way, are also those who are least likely to be affected by it. Because, you know, to be a victim of a violent crime, well, it helps to drink too much, but it also helps a lot to be young and male. And th those aren't the people who are particularly afraid of violent crime, even though they're the ones most likely to be implicated in it. So there's technological reasons for our, our concentration on the negative, and they're complex. It's not easy to figure out how to combat 
the spiral of outrage and attention seeking that I think is accompanying the death of our previous means of communication. No one, no one knows how to handle that. And, and that's a big problem. Let's go, I mean, I know so many in this audience, and not just here in New York, but we hear from our members all over the country. They're so concerned about what their children and what their grandchildren uh, are both being taught, but also what they're coming back home from college and, and talking about and saying, where are, you, where, where are they learning? I mean, they know where they're learning, but how is this get seeping into them? You obviously have spoken not just at the University of Toronto, but colleges all over the world. What is it you see today on the campus or among young people today that, that is, that's new or, or is it new? I've heard you say that we're no more polarized today than we were maybe even under Richard Nixon and the campuses were more on, on fire then than even they are today. So what are the similarities and differences that you're seeing? Well, I don't, I don't see any real evidence that your society is more polarized, generally speaking, than it has been at many times in the past. And I think the Nixon era is a good example. I mean, if, if, you, if you think about it merely statistically, I mean, you've been split 50-50 Republican-Democrat for, what, five elections now, and it's almost perfect 50-50 split. That really hasn't changed. Um, Trump, of course, is somewhat of a wild card, and so that complicates things, but I don't think it changes the underlying dynamic. Um, what I, what I do think is, is, has arisen again, because it's made itself manifest many times in the last 100, 100 years, is the rise of this group identity associated quasi-Marxist viewpoint with this additional toxic mixture and, and paradoxical mixture of postmodernism. Um, the postmodernists are famous for being skeptical of meta-narratives. That might be a d defining, that was Lyotard, I believe, who, who coined that, although I might be wrong. It was one of the French postmodernists. And that, that means that they're skeptical about the idea that uniting, large uniting narratives are valid. And it's a, it's a huge problem, that claim, because the first question is, well, how big does the narrative have to be before it's a meta-narrative? Right? I mean, is the narrative that holds your family together f a falsehood? Is the narrative that holds your community together a falsehood? Like, how big does it have to be before it becomes a falsehood? And so, it's a very vague claim. And it's a very, it's a very dangerous claim in my estimation, because I believe that, and I believe the psychological research is clear on this. What we have, we, our cognitive abilities are nested inside stories. We're fundamentally narrative creatures. That's how our brains are organized. And so to deny the validity of large-scale narratives is to deny the validity of the manner in which we organize our psyches. And that's unbelievably destabilizing for people. I mean, first of all, look, the simplest story in some sense, is that I'm at point A and I'm going to point B. And that's not as simple a story as it might sound because it implies that you are somewhere and that you know it, you have a representation of it, geographically, let's say, socially, psychologically, you have some sense of who you are. But more importantly, you have some sense of who you are transforming yourself into. And so that gives you a direction. And now that direction... The direction gives you meaning. And, and, I, and I don't mean that in a cliched sense. What I mean is that the way that our brains are constituted is that almost all the positive emotion that people feel, and it's also true of animals, by the way, is it emerges as a consequence of observing that you're making your way to a valued endpoint. So, you know, you think, well, what makes you happy is the attainment of something. And there is a form of reward that is associated with that. It's called consumatory reward. It's the satisfaction that you feel, say, after you have a delightful Thanksgiving meal. But that isn't the hope and the meaning that people thrive on. The hope and the meaning that people thrive on is the observation that they're moving towards something worthwhile. And that might be individually, although it, it really can't be because we live in collectives, 
but it should be collective. And that isn't optional. If you don't have a goal, a transcendent goal, say, something that's beyond you, then you don't have any positive emotion. And that's not good because you have plenty of negative emotion. And, and that's, that's the problem with fundamental claims of meaninglessness, too, in life. That it, it's, this, it's the philosophical error that's made by nihilists, let's say, who say, well, life is meaningless. It's like, well, if you're a nihilist, genu genuinely, you've lost all hope. Your life isn't meaningless. It's just unbearably miserable. And that's, and that's a form of meaning. You know, that suffering is a form of meaning. And you can try to argue yourself out of that with your nihilistic rationalizations, but that is not going to work. You need a transcendent goal in order to withstand the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. And the destruction of the narratives that guide us individually, psychologically, and that also unite us socially, familial and socially, it's an absolute catastrophe. And, well, the question then is, why is it being undertaken? And that's a complex question um, that, and I don't know if we can even discuss that. That, that has something to do with this un, in unholy marriage of the postmodern nihilism with, with this Marxist utopian notion which makes no sense at all because the postmodernists are skept skeptical of meta narratives, yet Marxism is a grand meta narrative. But coherency. It doesn't is, have to make sense. Well, that's, <laughs> well, it, that, in fact, the idea that it makes, that things have to make sense is part of the oppressive patriarchy, and so we can just dispense. <laughs> well, I'm serious. That people, 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 people teach that in, in a dead serious manner, that the requirement for logical consistency is an arbitrary. Um, it's an arbitrary imposition on cognitive structure. It's not something necessary for, for rational cognition, even if there is such a thing. I mean, you don't know how deep this war goes in some sense. I, I can give you an example. You know, there's a free debate about free speech on campus. But what you don't understand is it isn't a debate about who can speak. It's a debate about whether there is such a thing as free speech. And the answer from the radicals is that there isn't. Because for there to be free speech, you see, there have to be sovereign individuals, right? And those sovereign individuals have to be defined by that sovereign individuality. And they have to have their own locus of truth in some sense that's a consequence of that sovereignty. And then they have to be able to engage in rational, discursive negotiation with people who aren't like them which means they have to stretch their hands, let's say, across racial or ethnic divides. They have to be able to communicate and they have to be able to formulate a negotiated and practical agreement. And none of that is part of, and parcel of the postmodern doctrine. All of, that, all of that's up for grabs. There's no sovereign individuals. Your group identity is paramount. You have no unique voice. You're a mouthpiece of your identity group. You can't speak across group lines because you don't understand the lived experience of the other. And so it's not who gets to speak. It's whether the entire notion, it's a very classic Western notion and a very deep one of free and intelligible speech is even valid. I mean, these, these, this, this intellectual war that's going on in the universities is way deeper than a political war. It's, it's, it's and way, more, way more serious than a political war. It manifests itself politically, but, but no, it's, politics is way up the scale from where this is actually taking place. So when, you, when you're talking with students, both one-on-one -on -one or you're getting their questions, and I'm going to get to some of your questions here very shortly, these are not all conservative students that are coming up to you and they're downloading your videos and listening to your podcast. And it's not, even though it is a lot of young men, it's not all men. Right. What do you think drives people to the message and to the things that you talk about? Oh, I, I think it's that pe I'm believable. And <laughs> well, that's why, it's, that's why. I mean, you know, in, in most of my lectures, so I've done about 150 public lectures or so in the last year all over the world and to large audiences. The audiences in Australia were starting to approach, well, we had audiences for 5,500 people in Australia. So, which is quite remarkable, you know, that, that 5,500 people would come 
to listen to like a serious discussion about philosophical, theological, and and psychological issues, and and to participate in that. And and I don't pull any punches. I'm not speaking down. I would never speak down to an audience. I I think that's a dreadful error of arrogance. But the reason that I think people believe what I say is that I'm very pessimistic. <laughs> well, look, because most times when you when you listen to someone who's who's a motivational speaker, let's say, you know, it fills you with a, a temporary optimism, but you go home and, and and the wiser part of you knows that mostly it's it's the painting over of rotten wood with with a fresh coat of paint. And I tell my audiences very clearly that their life is going to be difficult and sometimes difficult beyond both imagining and tolerance. And that that is definitely in your future, if it isn't in your present. And for many people, it's in their present. And that that, and that, and that, that can be unbearable, that enough to turn you against life itself. To corrupt, to corrupt you, to, to drive you to nihilism, to drive you to suicide, and worse, to drive you to thoughts of, of vengefulness, of, of infinite scope, to, to not only be turned against yourself and your fellow men, but to be turned against being itself because of its intrinsically brutal, in some sense, nature. And, and then it's worse than that, actually, because it's not only that we suffer, and, and that that will necessarily occur, but that we all make our suffering worse because of our ignorance and our malevolence. And everyone knows that to be true. And so the discussions start, let's say, on, a, on, a, on an unshakable foundation. But then I can tell people, look, despite that, despite that, we're remarkable creatures. You know, we're capable of taking up the burden of that suffering and facing the reality of that malevolence voluntarily. We can actually do that. And all of the psychological evidence suggests, and this is independent of your school of psychology, if you're a practical psychologist, a clinical psychologist of any sort, the evidence is crystal clear that if people voluntarily confront the problems that face them and the malevolence that surrounds them, that they can make headway against it. And not only psychologically, so it's not only meaningful to do that psychologically, which, which it is, to, to confront the problems that, that torment you voluntarily, that's meaningful psychologically, but it's also practically useful in that you can actually solve some of the problems that beset you. And God only knows how good we could get at that, you know. I mean, I don't know what percentage of human effort is spent in counterproductive activity. You know, I, I'm, I'm not an absolute cynic about that, but I mean, when I talk to undergraduates, I ask them, you know, how much time do you waste every day by your own reckoning? And it's somewhere between five and eight hours. You know, it's a lot of, it's a lot of time. Well, and I usually walk through, I walk the stu students through an economic analysis of that. I said, well, you know, why don't you value your time at $50 an hour and calculate for yourself just exactly what you're doing to your future by your inability to discipline yourself. It's worth thinking through. In any case, people do waste a lot of time and they, are, they also act counterproductively a lot of the time. Regardless, we do make progress and, 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 and we can thrive under the difficult conditions that make up our lives and we can resist the malevolence that entices us. That's within our power and we don't know the limits to that. And we also know that it's better to, we all know this, that it's better to live courageously then cowardly. Everyone knows that. That's what you teach people that you love. And, and, and we know that it's better to live truthfully than in deceit. And you can tell that too because that's also what you tell people that you love. And we know that you should 
pick up your damn responsibility and move forward. Everyone knows that. It's, it's part of our intrinsic moral nature. And that nature is there. And it's not difficult to communicate to people about this. Like, everyone knows that you wake up at three in the morning when you've left, let your life go off the rails and that you berate yourself for your uselessness and your cruelty and your failure to take, op to take the opportunities that are in front of you. And if you were the master in your own house, in some sense, the captain of your own destiny, if there was no intrinsic nature, well, that would never happen. You'd just let yourself off the hook. There'd be no voice of conscience tormenting you. But no one escapes from that. And what that indicates is, to me is that, at least psychologically, we live in a universe that's characterized by a moral dimension. And we understand that well. And that moral failings have consequences. And, th and that they're not trivial. They destroy you. They destroy your family. They destroy your community. And, and you can tell people that. And they listen because they know. They don't know they know. That's the thing. And maybe that's the thing about being an, an intellectual. You, you have the opportunity to articulate ideas that other people know. They embody, but they can't articulate. And that's what people tell me. You know, they say, well, you help me give words to things that I always knew to be true but couldn't say. Or, or they say, I've been trying to put some of your precepts into practice, responsibility being a main one, vision another, honesty, I, I suppose, bringing up the pack and saying, and this is the fun part of doing all of this. Fun is a weak word that it's, 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 a, it's the remarkable part of doing all this. I mean, I have people tell me constantly wherever I go, it's so delightful that you know, they were in a pretty dark place and they tell me why and there's plenty of dark places in the world and they decided, well, maybe they were going to develop a bit of a vision and take a bit more responsibility and start telling the truth and putting some effort into something and they come up and they say, well, you can't believe how much better things are. It's like, <laughs> I've, I, got, I got three promotions. Oh, I had one guy tell me, this was a lovely story, you know, 15 seconds. He came up after a talk, he said, Two years ago, I got out of jail. I was homeless. He said, I own my own house. I have a six-figure income. I got married, and I have a daughter. Thank you. And that was the whole conversation. It's like he decided. He decided he was going to put his life together. And you know, and so you can look at that pessimism that, 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 that constitutes, let's say, the core of what... Well, I think it's the core religious message, really, is the, is the tragic nature of the world, the reality of suffering, it's, it's part of the core religious message. But what emerges out of that, properly conceptualized, is a remarkable appreciation for what human beings are capable of. Like, we are unbelievably resilient and, and able creatures, and we do not have any conception of our upper limits. Dr. Priest, let me ask you, I mean, it we have about 10 minutes, and I'm going to get a couple of questions in here from our audience on this, too. But is that that hope that you're talking about, that you're giving people hope, young people hope, is that one of the secrets to reaching them? Well, in it's terms a funny of kind of hope, on? you know, and, and, and it's, it's, it's such a perverse sort of hope because I would say for the last 45 years, we've told psychologists have been, have been certainly to blame for this, at least in part. You're okay the way you are. That's what we tell young people. Oh, you're okay the way you are. It's like, and there's nothing worse than you can tell, that you can tell someone who's young than that, especially if they're miserable, you know, and lots of them, well, if they're miserable and aimless, it's like, oh, I'm miserable and aimless, and sometimes I'm suicidal and I'm nihilistic and I don't have any direction in your life, it's, in my life. It's like, well, you're okay the way you are here. And it's like, they don't want to hear that. They want to hear, look, you know, you're, and you know this, you're useless. You know nothing. You haven't got started. You've got 60 years to put yourself together, and God only knows what you could become. And that's so, 
that message is so much more, it's so funny because it's so, it's such an attack, mm -hmm. but it's so positive because there's faith there in the, in the potential that makes up the person rather than the miserable actuality that happens to be manifesting itself at the moment. And young people respond extraordinarily well to that because, and you know that if you're a parent and you love your, your child, your son, your daughter, what you're trying to foster is the best in them. You want that to manifest itself across the course of their life. You want them to become continually more than they are, to see what they could be. And, well, and I think that's part of the great message of the West, is that that's, that's, the, that's the ethical requirement of individual being in, in, in the proper sense, is to constantly note that you're not what you could be, to take responsibility for that and to, and to commit yourself, like body and soul, to the attainment of that ideal. We're going to get a question here from our members right here on the front row. Bob Grantham had a couple of good questions right here. Uh, he asked, much of your effort today is trying to help people improve their lives. We've just been talking about that. Why does the establishment attack you rather than try to support your efforts? Well, you know, we should be nuanced about that. I mean, there's a, there's a group of newspapers in Canada um, called Post Media that's 200 newspapers strong, and they supported me. You know, I mean, I've had a lot of support from journalists, um, and I would say I've had more support from the higher quality journalists, which I'm quite happy about. <laughs> So it's polarized, you know, there, there, there is a, I have a dedicated coterie of people who regard me as an enemy. There's no doubt about that. And I, I think it's because I am, I am absolutely no fan whatsoever of the radical left. I think the, the fact that you can actively present yourself, let's say on a campus as a communist is as, the fact that that's allowable is as mysterious as it would be if it was allowable to present yourself as a Nazi. I am not a fan of the radical left. And, and I think I understand the motivations on the radical left, both on the postmodernist end and on the more Marxist end. And I'm, because of that, I'm a relatively effective critic and that makes me very unpopular. So, and that's fine, because I'm not, because what people are being taught that's emerged from that brand of absurd and surreal philosophy is of no utility as a guiding light to anyone. And it's a, it's a catastrophe to take young people in their formative years when they're trying to catalyze their adult identity and to tear the substructure out from underneath them and leave them bereft. And I do believe that that's what the universities, on the humanities end and to some degree on the social science end, I do believe that that's what they fundamentally manage to achieve. So... And I don't admire that. I think there's something deeply sadistic about that. There's something deeply anti-human about that. And it presents itself in the guise of moral virtue, which makes it even worse. And so, well, that's why people don't like me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we've got about five minutes. I'm going to try to get in two quick questions. This is, where is Adam from Vassar College? Is Adam... Oh, there he is. All right. So this was Adam's question. He said, given the liberal political order bends towards automization of individuals, e.g. automation and urbanization, how can meaningful community be assured? Well, you build that for yourself in part. You know, I mean, um, Adam, yes. get a girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean... People aren't doing that, you know, that, that's falling by the wayside, right? And, and so, and it, it's because it's trouble, you know, to, 
Well, it is trouble. Life is trouble, and it's trouble to establish a permanent relationship. You know, I mean, we've told young people for far too long that, well, they should be happy in their relationships, let's say, and it's like, that's weak. It's, well, it is. God, most of you are married. It's like, to be married for 40 years, that's, that's not a triumph of happiness. It's a, tri it's, a, it's a triumph of character. It's a triumph of negotiation, right? It's a, it's, it's a triumph of will to do that. And, 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 and that should be celebrated, but it should, it should also be pointed out that no matter who you find, like, they're no better than you, and that's not so good. So there's, <laughs> so there's gonna be problems. And so, but that shouldn't stop you. It's like, find someone. You know, you're going to have, if you're lucky, you're going to have the opportunity to sort of sift through about five people in your life. That's about it. Then you're going to have to stake yourself on one of those people. And it's a, well, it's, it's, a, it's a hell of a risk. But, but with any luck, it'll make you a better person. That, 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 that wrestling. You know, one of the things I learned, I did a series of biblical lectures in 2017, which have turned out to be crazily popular of all the insane things to be. And I was supposed to ask you, why do you think yes, that is? Yes, yes. Well, it, I learned, one of the things I learned in, 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 in those lectures and should have known before was that the word Israel, so the chosen people of God, the people of Israel, are those who wrestle with God. And that's such an interesting idea. You know, it's, it's a fascinating idea because it, it indicates at least, even, even in our deepest religious text, that there's some there's something about existential conflict and engaging in that that's actually part of the moral substructure of life. That, 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 that simple belief, let's say, whatever that might mean in a deity, isn't sufficient. Is that there's an active engagement with, with, with the infinite. And, then, and, it's, and it's a battle in some sense. And, and I think that's, that's the proper way to conceptualize it. I think it's the proper way to conceptualize a relationship it's, it's a battle. It's a battle towards a positive end. It's a battle towards the transformation of both of you into more than you could have otherwise been. So you need that, and you need your friends, and, and, and you need to develop a network of friendship, and you need to put your family together and to act responsibly towards them, and then you need to move out from that into the broader community, and that's on you, and that's how you foster it. You, 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 you make it a part of the ideal that you're pursuing, and then you, you realize that that's, that's up to you to do. And maybe then you realize that you can do it as well, if you're willing to make the right sacrifices, which really usually means burning off a fair bit of, of dead wood, and that's not something that people are particularly excited about doing, and no wonder. <laughs> Our time has been too short. Let, we I have time for just one more final okay. question, I'm told. What have I not asked you about? And, and thinking of our theme of, of standing up against socialism, what have I not asked you about? What have other interviewers not asked you about that would be beneficial for us all to know as we want to take well, that you, on? Well, you, you asked a little bit about these biblical lectures, you know, and what was interesting was I rented a theater in Toronto. I rented it 15 times, and, and it was a theater for about 500, and... It sold out every time, and I le lectured about Genesis, which, and it was mostly young men who came. They weren't all young, but they were mostly men, which was very surprising, because, like, that's just not what happens. And um, <laughs> what, the reason that the, the, the lectures worked and, and, and was because I, I put together something that I don't think liberals or conservatives have done a good job of putting together. The liberals are more on the happiness and freedom end of things, and the conservatives are more on the duty end of things. And those are both, those both have their place. But I've been attempting to develop an argument that's centered on meaning. And I do believe, and I believe that our, our most central religious symbols, like the, the symbol of the cross itself, for example, the bearing of the cross, is a an embodiment or a symbolic representation of this idea is that you, you have to have a meaning in life that sustains you. Life is a serious business. You're all in. It's a fatal business, right? Everyone's in it 
up to their neck. And it's, it's dreadful in some sense, in the classic sense. And you need a meaning that can sustain you through that. And that's to be found in responsibility. And that's something that we have not communicated I don't think well to ourselves, but we certainly haven't communicated it to young people. It's like, well, you're lost. There's reasons that you could be lost, and they're real. You know, God only knows what terrible things happen to you in your life. It's like, how are you going to get out of that? Well, not by pursuing impulsive happiness. That is not going to work. Not by thinking in the short term. Not by thinking in a narrowly selfish manner either, but by taking on the heaviest load of responsibility that you can conceptualize and bear. That will do it. It'll do it for you. It'll give you a reason to wake up in the morning. It'll give you a, a bomb for your conscience when you wake up at night and ask yourself what you're doing with your life. It'll make you a credit to yourself and to your family, and it'll make you a boon to your community. And more than that, there's more than that, you know, it's said in, the, in Genesis that every person is made in the image of God. And there's an idea in Genesis that God is that which confronts the chaos of potential with truth and courage. That's the logos. And if we're made in the image of God, that's us. That's what we do is we confront the potential of chaos, the future, the unformed future. We confront that consciously and we... We decide with every ethical choice we make what kind of world we're going to bring into being. We transform that potential into actuality. And we do that as a consequence of our ethical decisions. And so it's not only a matter of putting yourself together and putting your family together, and putting your community together. It's a matter of bringing the world in its proper shape into being. And I truly believe that that's the case. And I believe that we all believe that. Like, we hold ourselves responsible. You know that if you've made a mistake with your family, you know, because you were selfish or narrow-minded or blind in some manner, that you regard yourself as culpable. You could have done otherwise. And now you've brought something into the world that should not be there. And it's on you. We, we, we hold ourselves responsible in that manner. And so what that indicates to me is that in a deep sense, we believe that we are the agents that transform the potential of being into reality. And, and that is a divine, if anything, is, links us with divinity. It's our capability to transform what is not yet into what is. And... and the other thing that happens, and I'll stop with this in Genesis, and this is so interesting, it's so fascinating, is that as God conducts himself through this enterprise of the transformation of potential into actuality, he stops repeatedly and says, and it was good. And, 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 that, and that's a mystery. Is it, why is it good? And the answer is something like, well, if what if you conduct yourself with the courage that enables you to accept your vulnerability, which is no trivial matter, and if you're truthful, then what you bring out of potential is what's good. And that sets the world right. And that's up to us. And to me, that's the great, that's the great story of, of the West. That's why we regard ourselves as sovereign individuals of value, is that's what we are. And we need to know that, to take ourselves seriously and to act properly in the world. And so, and that's what I said in the biblical lectures in many hours, and that's what's made them popular because people, in, at, at, at the level of the soul, I would say, people know these things to be true, so. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me thank Jordan Peterson.
Thank you very much. If only uh, the folks in Washington had even an ounce of the conviction that you have. Thank you so much for being with My us. My pleasure. Thank you very it. much Thank for the invitation much. and Thank the you. questions. Oh, you'll be, we'll be inviting you back. Don't you worry. Well, there actually is someone else in Washington who does have this much conviction. Uh, and I have the great pleasure, along with all of my colleagues at the Heritage Foundation, of working alongside her every day. Uh, she is the woman who uh, leads and inspires us at the Heritage Foundation. Uh, she's a veteran of the Reagan and Bush administrations. Uh, she was a leader uh, in the Trump transition team. And she has been an advocate for traditional values and individual freedom in the public square for many years. And we are so delighted that she is now the president of the Heritage Foundation. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Kay Coles James. Wow. Dr. Peterson, thank you so very much. Was that not just an extraordinary discussion? Thank you, everyone. And it is indeed a pleasure to have you here at such a spectacular venue. Isn't this fantastic? I'd, um, I'd like to take a moment to recognize some of the distinguished guests who are joining us this evening. The first is one of our most generous supporters here in New York, Adrian Price, who was instrumental. Where's Adrian? Instrumental in helping guide and inspire tonight's event. I also want to recognize a wonderful friend to Heritage and to the conservative movement, a personal friend, our director, Rebecca Mercer. Rebecca, thank you for being here tonight. Marion Smith, where's Marion? Somewhere about. The executive director of the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation is also here. We also have policy experts and members of the senior management team from our wonderful coalition partner, the Manhattan Institute. We are delighted to have you with us tonight. We have several Heritage alum, Heritage Action Sentinels, and many of our local friends in the media are here as well. If they're here, they're the good guys <laughs> and gals. We're also delighted to welcome the next generation of America's leaders. We have over 30 students here from Columbia. <laughs> Columbia Law, Vassar, Yale Law, Cedarville University, Pace Law, and I understand a huge contingent from the King's College. And several other universities and institutions are represented here as well. We are so very glad that you're here. As far as I'm concerned, you're the key to getting the truth out to your peers about economic freedom, individual liberty, and ensuring that our generation, your generation, certainly not mine, isn't misled by the siren song of socialism. You have a tough job to do. Thank you for being here, all the young folks in the room. Tonight, we're also honored to be joined by representatives from the Swiss and Georgian embassies. Daniel Freihofer is the head of economic trade and financial affairs for the Embassy of Switzerland. Where are you, Daniel? Here. Thank you for being here. Switzerland was one of the most advanced free market economies in the world. Its institutional strengths include strong protections for property rights and little tolerance for corruption. 
As our 2019 index of economic freedom shows, this small yet highly competitive country is the world's fourth freest economy and tops the rankings for all of Europe. Thank you for being here. Giorgi Sicilia is the Deputy Chief of Mission for the Embassy of the Republic of Georgia. You are here somewhere. Thank you for being here. We're delighted to have you. Georgia has been a rising star in our index of economic freedom. The country's ongoing pursuit of greater economic freedom has made its entrepreneurial environment one of the top 20 on the globe. Georgia is the world's 16th freest economy far ahead of many larger economies like Germany, China, and Brazil. And finally, there's a guest I'd like to recognize who was one of the first to RSVP for this event, but isn't with us tonight. Mr. Harold Siegel was one of our fiercest and longest running supporters here in the New York City area. Harold was a kid from Queens the son of Jewish-Polish immigrants. When he was a young boy, he met the local printer while getting raffle tickets printed to raise money for uniforms for his little league team. He took such a keen interest that he began to learn about the printing business from that very young age. That eventually led Harold to start his own business, Excelsior Graphics and him becoming a respected leader in the industry nationwide. I had the opportunity to meet with Harold a couple of times over this past year, and we became fast friends. You could easily tell that he loved America and cared deeply about preserving freedom and liberty for all Americans. Part of that probably came from his service during the Korean War, fighting back against communist expansion. He and I talked about ways to expand the conservative movement in this country and ideas about how to grow the Heritage Foundation to preserve what we had here for future generations. Harold had RSVP to be here tonight, but the Lord called him home just two weeks ago. In his stead, Harold's daughter Laura and his grandchildren are with us this evening. Thank you for being here. My friends, it is my honor to salute a man who truly loved his American dream to the fullest and worked tirelessly to help others achieve theirs, Mr. Harold Siegel. Thank you so much. While this rising tide of socialism seems to be reaching a critical point, and I'm so delighted that you care enough about that to come join us here at the Heritage Foundation this evening. I am concerned that we may not recognize this nation in 10 years. And many Americans, especially our young people, seem to be warming up to that idea of bigger government as the solution to the issues that we face as a country today. However, the fact is socialism has failed, as you know, in every country, every time it's been tried. From Albania to Vietnam to the former Soviet Union and China, socialism has produced not prosperity, not freedom, but violence, starvation, and misery. Plain and simple, over the last 25 years, it truly has been capitalism and policies that promote economic freedom that have cut the global poverty rate by two-thirds. But I wanted to remind us tonight that capitalism isn't just about economics. We can see from the 25 years of data that Heritage has collected for its annual index of economic freedom that countries with the most economic freedom also have more individual freedom better health outcomes, greater life expectancy, more educational choices, and this will surprise our friends on the left, even a cleaner environment. 
So Heritage's ex, uh, index of economic freedom shows people the hard numbers so that they can compare for themselves the destructive nature of socialism versus the positive outcomes that capitalism provides. One piece of good news is that some of the polling that we have shows that young people who responded that they liked socialism didn't seem to understand what it actually was that they were asked. While initially people loved the ideas of free college tuition, $15 an hour minimum wage, health care for all, when they're told even a few details, what it cost them in taxes, how their freedom and their options would be restricted, how bureaucrats in far off places would be making decisions for them, they turn quickly against those proposals. What this tells us in the conservative movement is that the right answers, we have them, but we need to do a better job of communicating them, especially to this next generation. When people ask me, who is the audience that you're after? Well, how do you want to expand the conservative movement? I tell them my ideal audience is a group of Bernie Sanders supporters. <laughs> and that actually surprises them. And I am absolutely convinced that the things that they care deeply and passionately about, we actually have the answers. And our scholars have the data and the research and the analysis to prove it. And for the young people who are here, I want you to know that they are not more compassionate and caring than you are. I defy a Bernie Sanders voter to tell me that they care more about poor people than you do because they don't. I defy them to say that they want to provide access to health care while you want to push grandma off a cliff because that's just not true. I want you to know that if you really are interested in closing the gap on educational disparities as conservatives, we have the answers. And so the good news is, while they may claim the hearts of compassion, you should claim the heart of compassion, and then we have the research, the data, the analysis, and some really bad scholars that will back you up. So, we want to make sure that you are equipped to go out and fight the rising tide of socialism. We want to make sure you have the answers because they're there. So this is what I want you to do. OK, take out your smartphone. I'm serious. Get it out. <laughs> Got it? Older folks, ask a young person around you. I want you in the two section to put 474747. That's who you're going to text. And then the message you're going to send is heritage. 474747, heritage. And you know what that's going to get you? You'll receive information about our latest research on real solutions. We're going to equip you for the arguments and the debates. We're going to give you the knowledge that you need to take them on. Do it now. I hear it. Got it? I promise you it will be worth it with the data and the information you receive. See, the, for the older folks in the room, we, we send you emails. They don't read emails. <laughs> they want text messages. So we're trying to be responsive. Before I leave you tonight, and I do look forward to coming back to New York, I have so much I want to say to you.
And I do tend to be a tad bit optimistic. And I am because I truly believe in the American ideal and the American people and the legacy that our founders left us. So I want to leave you with this George Washington quote, the preservation of the sacred fire of liberty and the destiny of the Republican model of government are staked on the experiment entrusted to the hands of the American people. Ladies and gentlemen, our liberty, our destiny as a free nation has been entrusted into our hands. And I think we have established that we are at a critical time in our nation's history. And I'm absolutely convinced that if we leave this place tonight determined to stand strong against this homegrown socialism in our country, together we can debunk the lies and the empty promises of those who sing socialism's praises. Together, we can share the truth that limited government, free markets, and the rule of law are the surest ways to ensure freedom, prosperity, and opportunities for all Americans. Together, we'll ensure a future where you and your children and your grandchildren can live the legacy our founders left to us a legacy that millions of Americans have fought and died for, a legacy that no government should ever be able to take away. I, as your president, am determined every day to get up and go into the Heritage Foundation along with that phenomenal staff that's standing there and work hard to leave an America that's at least as free as the one that we inherited. Will you join us in doing that? Before I go, I'd like to premiere for you a new video that shows Heritage's immense impact and the opportunity that we have to take the battle to them. Please join me in watching. Thank you. Heritage is the conservative movement's largest and most effective voice in Washington. Located steps from the Capitol, Heritage has promoted conservative solutions for over four decades. We fight for the principles and values that animated our founders to create this great nation. They are the same principles and values we cherish today. Free enterprise, limited government, a strong national defense, traditional American values, and individual freedom. We provide our elected leaders with the policy solutions they need to ensure we remain a free and prosperous people. Our experts develop conservative solutions for more jobs, lower taxes, stronger families, secure borders, a more affordable health care system, and a national defense to protect it all. In addition to that, the Heritage Foundation works to expand the influence and size of the conservative movement. We team up with state leaders to keep Washington in Washington. Our Young Leaders Program recruits and trains almost 200 college interns each year who go on to serve on Capitol Hill, on political campaigns, and in other conservative organizations. And we take our message not just to Capitol Hill, but right to the American people. You'll see our experts talking about the benefits of conservative solutions across the media landscape. Ladies and gentlemen, Heritage's influence is needed now more than ever. We're standing strong against the rising tide of homegrown socialism 
and educating Americans about its dangers. We're debunking the lies and empty promises of those who sing its praises. And we're showing how conservative solutions are better solutions to the issues that face America. But the Heritage Foundation can't do it alone. Freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it on to our children in the bloodstream. The only way they can inherit the freedom we have known is if we fight for it, protect it, defend it, and then hand it to them with the well-taught lessons of how they in their lifetime must do the same. And if you and I don't do this, then you and I may well spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it once was like in America when men were free. The Heritage Foundation is your voice for limited government. For over four decades, we've kept our promise to fight for your way of life and against the big government tendencies of Washington. We fight for the American people, not for any political party. I invite you to stand with us because there's too much at stake to stand on the sidelines. Only with your help can we ensure that America remains the freest and most prosperous nation on earth. Like you, I don't want to leave my children or grandchildren an America that's less free than the one we inherited. Protecting our hard-fought American way of life is one of the greatest gifts we can pass on to the next generation.